Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at New Dublin. Very glad that you're here. If you are a visitor or a longtime member, and if you're online, we're glad that you're here as well. Um, as always, there are announcements in your bulletin. There is the birth announcement officially for Lincoln Richard. We are uh, delighted to welcome into our congregation. And uh, Elaine and Dan are both doing well. We mentioned yes, or last week, not yesterday, but last week, that uh, we are in the effort of upgrading our sound system and issued an invitation for those who wish to uh, donate towards that. And immediately that day received uh, several large donations that um, I want to say thank you for. Um, and if you would like to contribute to that, please speak to Gail or to Jim. In the, uh, the upcoming events list is possibly the most important part of the announcements. Uh, call your attention to that. Look at it. See what applies to you. Um, I will say especially that committee night is coming up on the 30th, 6.30 in the fellowship hall. Is there anything else that needs to come to our attention this morning? Yes. At one thirty in the shepherd's room back here. Yeah. Women's circle. Yes. The microphone is good if you want the people online to hear you. That's a good question. Hello. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we have decided um, the I mean, Sons of Confederate uh, veterans had given us um, a lot of food left over, new uh, good food, not not used food. They gave us uh, <laughs> a lot of hamburgers and uh, buns and uh, chips and stuff. So. Um, I want to invite you next Sunday after the service to uh, stay over and have a nice hamburger and have the lunch with us. We will be providing all that. You don't have to bring anything. Just come and enjoy a Labor Day barbecue with us downstairs. So, hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and for all you do. Anybody else? Then let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the Almighty God. And we pray that you would be present to us, that you would settle our hearts and our minds and take away all the things that distract us so that you would be present to us and we would be present with you 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 84 in the red hymnal. Brothers and sisters, if we are honest with ourselves, we know that we frequently fall short of the mark that God has in mind for us. But we hear in the scriptures that our God is gracious and eager to forgive. And so in faith, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Almighty God, we are unworthy to come into your presence because of our many sins. We have sinned against you, O Lord, and we have offended you. And yet, O Lord, as we acknowledge our sins and offenses, so also do we acknowledge you to be a merciful God, a loving and favorable Father to all who turn to you. And so we humbly ask you, for the sake of Christ your Son, to show mercy to us and forgive us all our offenses. Forgive the sins of our youth and the sins of our old age. By your Spirit, O oh God, take possession of our hearts so that not only the actions of our life, but also the words of our mouths and the smallest thought of our mind be governed and guided by you through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and all has become fresh and new. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
morning we are in Hebrews chapter 3. If you would like to follow along with me in your Bibles. But before we read it, let us pray. Most gracious God, you caused all of the Holy Scriptures to be written for our benefit. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3. Hear the word of God. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in a heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation, and I said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. As in my anger I swore, they will not enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For if we have become partners in Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end, as it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion." Now, who were they who heard and yet were rebellious? Was it not all who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? But with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Last week, it was important for you to know that Jesus is higher than the angels. And again, that was not because we need to have a clear metaphysical ranking of every being that ever existed and where they fall, but so that you have a sense of the glory that Jesus is going to share with you. We talked about what I called the swoop of salvation. I'm still not sure how I feel about that. How Jesus came down to get us and then takes us back up with him. It's important to know that Jesus is higher than the angels because when we're down in the dumps of life, in the cold creek of sin and death and evil, it helps us to live with the true hope that this is not how the story ends. That was last week. This week, he wants you to know that Jesus is more faithful than Moses. Despite what it seems like at first glance, this is actually a pretty sensible progression because the problem is that the swoop of salvation can feel an awful lot like the roller coaster from hell when you're actually in it. I don't know how you all feel about motorcycles, not motorcycles, roller coasters. I do not like them. I've never really understood the point of riding a machine that's trying its best to kill me. But I've ridden them nonetheless. Uh, one year I went to Dollywood, Dolly World, Dollywood, what do you call that place? Dollywood, right? Uh, with my Girl Scout troop. And I was the only one who didn't like roller coasters, been 
I would be darned if I wasn't going to ride every single one of them with the rest of the Girl Scout troop. And by the end of the day, my arms and my legs were bruised from how tightly I would hold on to the harnesses. That was the last time, never, ever, ever again. I can opt out of any more roller coasters in my life, uh, but I can't necessarily opt out of the feeling that roller coasters give me. You know that feeling, don't you? The one where you're going up the first hill, and you're probably, in the modern ones, straight up vertical, hanging off the edge of this thing, and you just start to tip over the edge, and the roller coaster stops, just to give you a minute to reflect on the life choices that have brought you to this moment, staring down the bottom of this big uh, hill. And you have a moment to think about uh, the things that have led you to this point, um, and to reflect on the fact that you are stuck now on this roller coaster, and there is nothing you can do to get off the roller coaster until it gets you back to the station. Roller coasters are probably the safest way you can feel that feeling, but they're not the only way. I feel that feeling when someone I love is given a diagnosis that I don't want to hear, a friend or a family member or a pet or me, or when I find out that something I did or said has hurt somebody else or when I was in college and my boss emailed me and asked me for a one-on-one -on -one meeting later that week. And even good things that are serious and life-changing can feel like being on the top of the first hill of a roller coaster looking over the edge, getting dropped off at college that first year, getting the two pink lines on a pregnancy test, getting accepted for a job that's going to mean you have to completely uproot your whole life and your normal activities and go somewhere else. Life's roller coaster starts ticking up the hill and we realize there is no way out of this but through it. That's when it's important to know that Jesus is more faithful than Moses. We read that line today with 2,000-odd years of anti-Semitism behind us, and we cringe. It strikes us at first as something like, you like Moses? Too bad, losers. Jesus is where it's at. But that's not what the preacher of Hebrews meant by it at all. That would undermine the point he's trying to make. Remember, this whole community is Jewish. There weren't these deep, clear lines yet between Christianity and Judaism. So when the preacher invokes Moses, he's not doing it to disrespect Moses. He and his original hearers thought Moses was the most faithful person who had ever lived. Maybe he lost his temper once or twice. Maybe he did something he shouldn't have done. But that was not the defining feature of his life. The defining feature of Moses' life is that he was faithful to God. So when the preacher of Hebrews says that Jesus is more faithful than Moses, it's as if he were saying, you know the best guy in history, the most faithful guy, Moses. So if I tell you that Jesus is more faithful than Moses is, he's really, really faithful. It's hard to even translate into our modern assessment of heroes because, you know, even somebody like George Washington doesn't quite come close, but it's the best that I can come up with. We like to tell that apocryphal story about how George Washington couldn't tell a lie, right? He cut down the cherry tree. You can't tell a lie. I cut down the cherry tree. So if we are talking about our friend and we say, our friend is more honest than George Washington, we're not insulting George Washington, right? We're just assuming you know George Washington's reputation as a really honest guy. And if we were implying that George Washington was actually a liar, that would not help our case for our friend's honesty at all. That's how the logic today flows. Moses is great. Everyone knows it. So if I were to tell you that Jesus is even better than that, dot, dot, dot. The preacher uses a couple of other metaphors just 
to drive the point home. It's like the difference between a house and the person who builds the house, he says. Or maybe it's like the difference between a servant and the person he serves. Moses was a faithful servant in God's house, but Christ is the faithful son who rules God's house. And God, we're told, uh, rather, we are God's house, is what we're told. God is invested in us. We are his house, it says, if we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. That's why it's important to know that not only is Jesus more important than the angels, he's also more faithful than Moses. It's so that we can hold firmly, as it puts it, to our confidence and our hope, even in the face of life's roller coasters. The day I rode all of the roller coasters, my Girl Scout leader would remind me that even though she knew it didn't feel like it, I was safer on the roller coaster than I was in the car on the way there. I surely did not feel safer. I'm not usually clinging on to a car for dear life, but I was. About four people every year die from roller coaster related injuries in the United States, and 39,000 people die from car wreck related injuries. Seems a bit cruel to tell you this when you can't ride a roller coaster home from church today. You do have to drive. Please be careful. That fact that I was safer on the roller coaster, even though it didn't feel like it, and the good southern lady fear of making a scene, was just about the only thing that kept me from trying to stop the ride and escape. There were stairs, I noticed, that went up the big hill. I was tempted. But I didn't do it, and I repeated it to myself like a mantra. When life has you strapped in, when it flips you on your back and shoots fire in your face and drops you straight down several hundred feet with next to no warning, Hebrews has a mantra for you to repeat. Jesus is even more faithful than Moses. More honest and true than George Washington or Mr. Rogers or whoever the best person you can think of is. If you would have trusted them, if they had told you that you were going to make it through this ride, you can trust Jesus when he tells you that he's going to get you through, that he's taking you on his path to the Father, and that he's not going to leave you in your troubles and on your roller coaster. There's just one problem. There's no guarantee, Hebrews points out, that when we're in the thick of things, we would trust anyone to tell us that God's going to get us through it. Maybe it's tempting to think, you know, if Moses were to appear and tell me everything was going to be okay, I could hang on then. I would believe it. I would be sure that Moses is telling me the truth. But, eh, says the preacher of Hebrews, eh, I wouldn't be too sure. It's not like the people Moses did tell that to believed him. They had constantly thought that they had a better plan. God shows them the promised land and tells them that's where they're going. And they looked at it and said, mm, that looks really dangerous. How about we don't? And as much as we like to think that we'd be better than that with the benefit of hindsight, human nature really just hasn't changed all that much in the intervening few thousand years. We'd probably do the exact same thing. And faced with God's promise in our life that despite the roller coasters, maybe even through the roller coasters, God is going to be faithful to us and bring us down the same path that Jesus trod to glory, we might still think that we know a better way, a way that has fewer hills and sudden drops and upside-down loops. We might try to strike off on our own for a way that feels safer. And the problem is that our plans will lead us the same way that Israel's plans did, wandering in the wilderness instead of living in the promised land. That's probably what we're going to do, says the preacher, if we're left to our own devices. So don't. 
Don't get left to your own devices. And don't leave your brothers and sisters to their own devices either. That's the solution he offers. See to it, he says, see to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. We all need a Girl Scout leader as often as possible to remind us that the roller coaster, despite how scared we are, is still about the safest thing we could possibly be on. That despite and through the drops and whirls and loops and swoops, that it will bring us safely back to the station. And because we all need to hear it daily, sometimes more often than that, if we're currently hanging on for dear life, we need to remind each other daily in love. Every day, as long as it's called today, the preacher says. Let's try it. Once a day this week, try to have a conversation with somebody else at New Dublin. Text them, call them, email them. Listen to them, encourage them, remind them in yourself that God is faithful in whatever situation you and they are in. Encouragement is how we're going to make it. It's how God's promise will be louder than our troubles. It's how faith is going to win over fear. It's why God hasn't put any of us on this journey alone. Why God has called us together to be his church. According to Hebrews, it's how we can hold firmly to our confidence and to the hope in which we glory. Those roller coasters are big and loud, and they might shoot fire at you. And they might nearly convince you that this is how you're going to spend the rest of eternity. But you're not riding them alone. You've got the church with you. You've got Jesus Christ with you. And we're all here to remind you and promise you that you're going to make it back to the station where eternal rest and joy and peace, where God himself is waiting for you. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please rise as you are able and join me in the Apostles' Creed, which is in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The hymn is number 360.
Please be seated. In gratitude and thanksgiving for all God has done for us, let us return to the Lord the tithes and offerings of our life and labor. <laughs> things in heaven and on earth are yours, O Lord our God, and of your own have we given you. Accompany these gifts by your Spirit, so that the work they may do may be your work, bringing your kingdom here to us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to the prayers of the people, I have a, a, a few prayer requests. I know Barbara, as you may have seen on the prayer chain, is doing better. She's still in her room, um, but is beginning to feel better. Juanita, likewise, is doing well after her surgery. Uh, we continue to pray for both of their continued healing Bud Jeffries is uh, not only still sick, but still does not really know what's wrong with him. Um, so let us continue to keep him and Anne in your prayers, and we will uh, continue to take care of them as we can, and, and we'll let you know uh, when we know what we can do for them. Who else do we need to pray for this morning? We will continue to pray for Martha. Let us, oh. Yes, absolutely. We will pray for the children and the teachers. Yes, absolutely. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you that you hear our prayers, that you invite us to pray, and that when our words fail, you offer us your spirit who prays with us and sighs too deep for words. We pray for your church, for your church in places where it is dangerous to be the church, where war or legislation or the prejudice of their neighbors has made it risky to come and to confess your name and to worship you. 
We pray that the blood of the martyrs would be as ever the seed of the church. We pray that you would bring their persecution to an end, that you would give them favor in the eyes of their government and in the eyes of their neighbors. We pray for your church as well in places where it is almost too easy to be the church, where the temptation is in complacency. We pray that there your spirit would wake the church and cause it to watch with Christ. We pray for the world that you made, that you love, that you uphold. We pray for places that are racked by war or are in fear of war or are damaged by informal forms of violence where the government has failed or where there is civil war or where there are gangs. We pray that you would bring to those places a just and honorable peace that protects the lives of all and the dignity of all. And we pray for places that have suffered natural disaster, that you would bring healing especially today for China. And we pray for our own country, the United States of America, for our president and our governor, for all who are in any form of public service, for all who have words that many people attend to, we pray that you would give all who have power a sense that they have been given power for the good of the people and not for their own comfort or their own party or their own selfish ambition. We pray that you would bring unity and peace to a nation that is more and more divided. And we pray for those who are dearest to us, for Martha and for Barbara, for Bud, for Juanita, for the children and the teachers who go back to school, for all whom we name before you now in silence. Lord, you know all who are sick. You know all who suffer in secrecy. You are the physician of our souls and of our bodies. And we pray that you would heal all in the manner that is best for them. We pray all these things in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hem is number 437.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Christ our Lord.